Data from the National Association of Realtors tells us that 88% of home buyers purchased their home using a real estate agent in 2021. 100% of those buyers could have created thousands of dollars in donations to support climate action without any cost out of pocket by finding their real estate agent through Climate Change Realty. Welcome to the podcast. John, really great to meet you, man. Thanks so much for taking some time to come on the show. Really appreciate it. I'm um, looking forward to it, Ethan. Nice to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one in particular as well. We're really aligned on what we're interested in. And this this idea has kind of evolved in my mind over learning new things over the years. And it seems like it was the same case with you throughout your career. So I'm really intrigued to hear how you got to where you are now. So why don't we start by talking a little bit about that? Like, who are you? How'd you get to be doing what you're doing at the current moment? Sure. How much time you got? <laughs> you got plenty of time, uh, man. Well, the short version is I, I um, you know, I got out of college with a degree, a joint degree in economics and poli sci, but with this idea that economics would become the kind of organizing framework for the future of international relations, which is what I was interested in. So I, um, I pursued a, a career in banking, not for the typical reasons of, oh, you know, go to Wall Street and make money, but because... I saw finance as the kind of organizing glue of, of the global, um, you know, international economic system. And I wanted to learn about it. And um, so I, I got a job at what was then called Morgan Garney Trust Company and, and had a, you know, a wonderful career as it evolved from a commercial bank into an investment bank and caught the, the derivatives wave early, uh, was in Tokyo when Tokyo was at the peak. And, and you know, it was, it was sort of a... Um, you know, Goldilocks story of what what could what could be wrong with this, but but throughout it, I was kind of growing increasingly. Uh, I would just use the word restless, and I kept sort of moving around different parts of the bank to get new excitement and learn new things. But um, by the end by the end of the time I spent there, which was nearly twenty years, there was kind of this strong voice speaking to me saying, you know, what are you doing with your life? What's the point of this? And are you really um, doing what you want to do? And so the, the bank JP, was then called JP Morgan and merged with Chase. The old JP Morgan culture clearly was going to be over. And so I just used that as, an, as a reason to walk away from it all with literally no plan and, and lots of questions about why I wasn't enjoying it and what I wanted to do next. And Again, to make a long story short, the, the next big event was that summer uh, or that, that fall, I had my first kind of meeting back in Manhattan to think about what would be next. And, and I should say I had become involved in what we now call impact investing while I was still at Morgan. I invested in a charter school management company. So I was already thinking about sort of aligning capital and social environmental purpose even though I didn't, I couldn't describe it. And I was having all the conversations about, you know, can you, can you work on a social purpose and make money or are you going to end up doing both poorly? And all those conversations that are still happening today, I was having in the late 1990s. Um, but at any rate, in, in uh, the, literally the first day I got back on the train and went into Manhattan, I had a meeting with a, a different charter school management company, the CEO of a different company, and his offices were on Lower Broadway, and the meeting was at 9.30 in the morning, and it was September 11th. So I experienced that tragedy uh, from the street, you know, a quarter mile away or so. And um, all I can say is that that experience pushed me into a kind of a deep think period in my life, and I started reading tons of books that I hadn't normally had the interest or curiosity to read. And, and um, you know, it's a long, that was a multi-year period of my life. Um, but I'll just mention one book, which was, was part of this rolling epiphany, which is a book that literally is now celebrating its 50th anniversary. It's called Limits to Growth. And it was written by a group of MIT system scientists. And it essentially explained that exponential growth of the material throughput economy on a finite planet doesn't work forever, even though it worked well in the past. And it, it hit me like a ton of bricks um, uh, because it essentially explained that the future can't continue the way the past. And, and um, I had found a way to channel my, my kind of restlessness into 
a big question about essentially the future of capitalism, the future of economics. So that's how I got into into this gig. <laughs> I like it. I'm wondering if this I- hypothesis that you had as a young man, this idea that international relations or just the way we um, work together as a society was most ruled by economics throughout your career proved to be true. I know I had a hypothesis as a young man that I'm the smartest guy ever and I'm going to become emperor of the world and everyone's going to love me. And I don't know if that one is going to pan out. Yeah, like I, I think you got time to work on it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not interested in that anymore. <laughs> but I, I, I imagine that that w- that's that seems to be I'll, I'll let you kind of explain how that, that thought process evolved. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I've, I've obviously I've told my story many times before and no one's ever really asked me to to. Um, expand on that but it's actually i think a really interesting question because uh and and i'll I'll say a couple more another sentence on it i actually took a course called the economics of international relations which is what caused me to switch my major and pursue this and the thesis of the course was very much what you just said um uh, and again for everyone listening i'm you know i'm taking us back to this would have been roughly 1980 and right at the beginning of the whole globalization movement, or at least the, the recent iteration of the globalization movement, but it hadn't started yet. And so, you know, uh, and, and, and for sure, globalization was led by, you know, an economic um, uh, energy more than a political energy, although the political energy needed to allow it. Um, so I think the thesis in the class proved to be correct, but in a way that the professor nor I had any idea. And in fact, the fact that the thesis was correct proved to be a disaster, um, uh, which none of us were anticipating. Um, but we, you know, we now run the world essentially on a on an economic ideology that is fatally flawed. And we've allowed it to usurp and occupy the the role that civil society traditionally played, uh, very much to our detriment. So, so the answer to your question is yes, and the consequences uh, were were not foreseen. Right. Well, it, I think it's fatally flawed. I wouldn't necessarily say fatally flawed, but if not incomplete, meaning it, it, it isn't taking into account other factors that need to be brought into the calculation. It's a formula that needs to be completed is the way I would see it. And then I would also see international relations is just the idea of how do people who live differently and see the world differently learn to cooperate? And mm-hmm. having simple rules like supply and demand, I think, makes that really, really easy, whether it, you go all the way back to barter and trade. I'm of the opinion that markets exist, whether we call them markets or not. So I think it, it, it's a, it makes sense for organizing ourselves to me personally, I suppose. But I'm, I'm wondering, what, what do you think is the purpose of capitalism or markets? Why do markets exist? And, how, and then how do they work in practice today? Mm. So, so I'm going to challenge you a little bit, Ethan, on your, Please on, do. your Please do. on your view and not, I mean, I totally get it. Um, and I, I, you know, this is one of these things you, I rattle off a statement without explaining what I mean by it. And, and it, it can get interpreted in many different ways. Um, and, and I invite you to take our course on regenerative economics, where we, we go into this in detail, but in, in my, um, study of this question, I was, and, and, and again, I was an economics major in college. I t- did an MBA. I worked in a bank for nearly 20 years. And I had no idea that the foundation of neoclassical economics, which is what is taught today in school, it is the basis of all economic thinking, whether it's quote unquote free market thinking or quote unquote, um, you know, socialist or uh, highly regulated government intervention economics, all of that is built on this uh, framework called neoclassical economics. And there's a long story behind this, but the the reason I use the word fatally flawed, and I mean it literally not in a, that's not an opinion, that's a scientific statement. It's literally built on Newtonian physics. 
and an assumption that you can apply Newtonian physics to economics. And of course, we know that Newtonian, Newtonian physics is incomplete, um, but we also know, and, and the physicists at the time were telling the early economists, you can't do that, that makes no sense. So we've literally built the economic framework, economics framework that we use, again, regardless of whether we're free market believers or not, okay. on, on, a, on, a, out, on outdated physics, but not aligned with what we actually understand about how, how life works in this world. So, so I, I, I can make the case and defend it that, that the foundation of economics is actually fatally flawed. And I would argue that we use all kinds of math and statistics to make arguments that are essentially trying to support our ideological views, not any kind of scientific foundation. And that's the fight we're stuck in. And so you've got the free market folks and the government intervention folks fighting each other over ideology, but both of them uh, using you know, fatally flawed economic theory. And theory matters when you run the world on a system that, you know, it, it, it'd be like saying you're going to fly, but ignoring the law of gravity. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, are you specifically for referring to this idea that we can exponentially grow? So the idea being that we can, there's a, a glass of water and we think that we can keep pouring more and more water in, but eventually it'll hit the brim and it might, what's that, that scientific term where the water can kind of hang over the edge a little bit and then eventually it spills out. At the edge, yeah. So that's a great that's a great um, example. Uh, the 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 material throughput. You know, when we say growth, it can mean different things to different people. But let's be precise and talk about it as the material throughput of the economy: energy, materials, how many houses, how much energy it takes to build, how many factories, etc. Um, it it is a fact uh, of 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 um, you know, the, the second law of thermodynamics, the entropy law, tells us that you you can't do that forever uh, on a finite planet that is not creating more physical materials or expanding. And and there's a really interesting bit of research just came out that that kind of blew my mind in and that is that the the cumulative uh, mass of human built stuff Buildings, bridges, roads, um, etc., now exceeds the biomass, the living mass on this planet, and and those lines crossed in 2020, mm -hmm. and those lines didn't cross with sort of a gentle slope. There, the, the the human mass is is growing exponentially. Talk about so, some strong evidence for the Anthropocene. Hey, so like you know. I mean, it doesn't take, I mean, a sixth grader will tell you, ooh, that's a problem, right? Because like they can envision a world with no trees and grass and, and, and nothing but concrete and buildings. And, um, and even well, if- Well, if we're building good stuff, it's not a problem. Yeah, but that's uh, the problem because the, the, the planet itself is a living system. And so you can't mess with it. it and we're, the, you know, climate change is just a symptom of messing with the geochemical- flows in that case the carbon cycle of this living being called planet earth you know gaia theory was developed interestingly right around the same time in, in the 70s as limits to growth where james lovelock hypothesized that the planet itself is a living system and now mm -hmm. and it was you know he was he was laughed at and ridiculed now um it's still a somewhat controversial claim but only because we need to then define on what we mean by living, not because there's any debate about whether the planet is this magical, self-organizing, self-regulating, constantly evolving system that, that adapts and adjusts to keep it just right so that life can exist on this planet and no other planet that we know of. Um, so, you know, the, the, the hypothesis of regenerative economics is that it's, it's a human economy we're talking about, and humans are living systems. No controversy there. Gaia is a living system. That's the premise, the planet itself. And, um, and it's not expanding. So if the human economy is going to be sustainable, much less thriving for humans 
and other forms of life, it will need to behave like all other living systems behave that are part of this magic of Gaia. And, and you, don't, you don't get there by patching neoclassical economics. You get there by beginning with first principles on how life actually works. And that's essentially the essence of my work for the last 10 years. I love it. Who, who are some of the most prominent thinkers that have influenced the way we think about capitalism and, and economics today? These, these neo, who are the fathers of, what did you call it, neoclassic yeah, economics? Neoclassical? Yeah. So, um, of course, everyone's heard of Adam Smith. Um, Adam Smith is, is, uh, was, was roughly 50 years prior to this. He's known as a classical economist. Um, uh, which is really um, when economics and political philosophy were one, were one field. They, they, they didn't used to be separate, which, by the way, was a mistake to separate them. Um, and then the, um, you know, the, the, the name that perhaps if I were to pick one person, it would be Irving Fisher, um, mm-hmm. who, who wrote a, Uh, kind of a treatise, I forget what it's called, on neoclassical economics. He was a mathematician. And if you open the book, you know, if you're like me, you won't be able to read it. Um, But but I did open the book and found this incredible little chart that showed exactly how he developed the math of neoclassical economics. And so it had literally one column of Newtonian mechanics and another column of whatever he called it, nat- national natural economy or whatever. And he then had an arrow from, you know, this column to this column. And just to, you know, again, not to get into the weeds here, but just to give you an example, the, the, in, in Newtonian physics, the word is particles. And mm-hmm. Newtonian physics is premised on the idea that particles are the unit, you know, we're, the world's filled with parts called particles. And so he draws, draws an arrow and the word under economics is individuals. So he simply assumed that individuals behave like particles. But of course, we know individuals, human beings, are way more complex than atoms. And they have all kinds of interests and values and complexity um, that, um, uh, that particles would never you know, dream of. And, and, and I'll, I'll mention one other one. Work is um, uh, the arrow from work moves to um, disutility. In other words, work is assumed to be something that we don't want to do. It's a bad. And, and, and of course, if, if one has a career that one enjoys, work is their purpose. And so the whole thing is fatally flawed. Um, so Irving Fisher would be one... But, you know, there's a couple of um, uh, Leon Wallace is a name. There's a couple of French names. Most people would never have heard of, of these names. The economists people have heard of are, are uh, much more people that came later. So Keynes um, patched, one, you know, the, a lot of these economic um, advances were fixing flaws of, they were sort of patching neoclassical economics. So Keynes came along and said, wait a second, the, the assumption in neoclassical economics is that markets are self-regulating and we just had a depression. So what happened? Well, turns out government can spend money to be the, the, the balancing factor in an economy in extreme situations like a depression. So he's probably the greatest economist most people have ever heard of. Mm-hmm. But in a sense, he was fixing one of the flaws of neoclassical economics. Um, and then, you know, the, the other thing I think people now confused with the problems of neoclassical economics is this ideological split between the left and the right. So you have Milton Friedman and Hayek on the right, the free market, you know, um, uh, crowd. And you have, you know, largely Keynes and and his followers who are now seen as on the left, who, um, because he introduced the idea of government spending as a balancing factor in the economy, that's been, you know, turned into government should be organizing the economy. Um, which is an inaccurate, but it's it's a it's a way to 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 separate the world, the ideological split in the world. But the point I'm making is both of them are building their ideologies on this foundation of neoclassical economics. And your biggest issue with that is that it doesn't take into account the fact that there is limited resources on a limited planet. Is, is that right or no? You know, I, I'd say that's a that's sort of the easy flaw. 
the more profound we, we go for flaw, the easy on this show go ahead yeah the, the more profound flaw is um that they don't they don't take account of the um how do i say it the the, the genius of living systems okay um so so they we're, we're missing so, so backing up for a second, this planet's been around for whatever, 4 billion years. Mm-hmm. To our knowledge, at least in our um, you know, solar system, it's the only planet with life on it, which dramatically understates how profound that is. You know, the difference between a rock floating around in space versus what's happening on this planet is, is beyond description in words. And, and the amazing thing is that the life on this planet is adapting to the changing context. Literally we're moving closer to the sun. And so photosynthesis comes along just in time to adapt to that increased radiation. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly magic and uh, the regenerative process. So, so here's what I'll, I'll introduce the idea of regeneration. You know, your body and my body are regenerating at a cellular level as we're having this conversation, literally, on average, every seven years, your body is made up of entirely new cells, different rate for different parts of your body, uh, same with everybody's. And, um, and so it's adapting to a changing context. Um, uh, if, if that process, that regenerative process that enables that to happen didn't exist, the law of entropy would have taken over and everything would have been degraded and turned to dust. Can you just briefly explain what entropy is? Yeah, so entropy is the second law of thermodynamics. It essentially, think of a a log of wood. You light a log of wood on fire and wood turns to ash. The the energy released is dissipated into the air is in the form of heat. And you can never reburn that log because it's now ashes that that scatter into the air. So you've, you've, you know, the the way the scientists, they use the language, it, it went from order to disorder where it went from potential energy to used energy. Got it. And the, the, the entropic process is, is sort of a bummer, right? It's like things are running down, things are degrading. You know, you and I eventually will turn into dust as well. Or um, it's kind of beautiful because it makes you value all the, every second that you have. At, it should, for sure. But the, ma- the amazing thing is that despite this sort of downward depressing thing called entropy, there's this upward spiraling thing called life. And life is beating entropy. Life has existed for billions of years. Human life has existed for however many years. And and were it not for the magic of the living system process, everything would have turned to dust. So the premise of regenerative economics is, Jesus, we ought to learn how that process works and get in alignment with it. When in reality, what we've done is we've accelerated the entropic process by burning fossil fuels and building stuff and mining stuff and um, uh, and, and and overwhelming the, the the magic of life itself. That's the bad news. The good news is we actually understand this regenerative process. You can go and learn about it in school. Um, it's it's not you know it's 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 relatively recent that we've understood it. Uh, meaning in certainly in my lifetime, but in, even in the last, I would say, 40 years, um, people have been studying this intensely. Um, and so the promise of regenerative economics is that, you know, imagine how much better we can do if we align with these patterns and principles of, of living systems. It's, it's analog- the analogy would be, imagine if we're trying to figure out how to fly and we've discovered the law of gravity. And now we try to align with the physics of gravity when we try to learn how to fly. I think it would be easier. Uh, right. We would develop something called a wing. Um, and by the way, there's wings out there. They, they, they exist on birds. And so life has actually figured out how to fly. So maybe we should learn how life works as our, as our guiding uh, light to how to organize and manage an economy. So as you became introduced to the, the flaws in the system that you were involved with, when did you first find this more regenerative way of looking at things? What was your introduction to the ideas of regeneration? Yeah, so um, are you familiar with the term synchronicity? Sounds familiar, maybe. So synchronicity <laughs> is like a coincidence. 
that is too amazing to be a coincidence. And, and um, it's a, it's, it comes from a Jungian psychology and um, it gets a little bit woo woo. So um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just That's my favorite. a little bit, but it's kind of this idea that, that ideas show up in some miraculous way that seems too, too amazing to be true. So the answer mm-hmm. to your question is I, I, I was wrestling with this whole question of economics. Um, E.F. Schumacher was one of my early inspirations, and I wrote a paper uh, called The Relevancy of E.F. Schumacher in the 21st Century. It would have been around 2008. And the Schumacher Society put it out on the net, and, uh, and a guy called Alan Savory sitting in Zimbabwe, someone sent it to him, and he sent me an email. And Alan Savory is, is, um, is, is now well known for developing what's called holistic plan grazing, which is essentially regenerative agriculture applied to grasslands. And um, he sent me a note. He came and visited. We ended up um, becoming friends. We built a company together to show that managing holistically can be, um, uh, you know, is, is provable over time and actually generates not only positive ecological outcomes, but positive financial outcomes. And so I was introduced to this idea through essentially ranching, uh, a radically different way of ranching that's in alignment with how life works, the biomimicry, Mm -hmm. the, you know, essentially the grasslands were, um, grew up in symbiotic relationship with the bison. And that turned the grasslands into the second largest carbon sink after the oceans. Um, most people don't have any idea that the grasslands that we fly over in our airplanes are a massive carbon sink, but we severed the relationship between large herbivores and the grasslands in our reductionist thinking to make meat, the meat industry more efficient. And we created, we turned the second largest carbon sink into a source and releasing carbon. And so I had this idea that, well, if we can learn how to manage grasslands within our economy, within a, um, uh, the context of ranchers making a living working with the land, in that case in raising animals, and, and, and leave aside the, um, the whole issue of um, you know, vegetarians and vegans versus meat eaters, I, I'm in complete agreement that the industrial meat system is a horrific disaster, both ethically and ecologically. But what many people don't realize is that by eliminating uh, livestock from the grasslands, we actually degrade the grasslands. If you go to a national park with no animals, you're gonna see nothing but dust. So anyway, to to answer your question, I learned about this in the context of grasslands and had this insight that, wow, if this works in a system called ranching and grasslands management, why couldn't it work in this system we call the global economy? And that's been the, that's been the search ever since. And then oh, it turns out I'm not the only one thinking this way. Um, so. No, cer- certainly not. Um, it's People are always looking for the, the next wave, the better way to live. And to me, I, I was introduced in, I wouldn't say necessarily through regenerative agriculture. It was through re- regenerative earth. So I guess like natural climate solutions, how to regenerate forests to draw down carbon is how I first right. became interested in this way of thinking. And I've just been enthralled ever since. And I'll get kind of into some more of my ideas later on. But I'd love to hear all about um, what the Capital Institute is, why it exists, and how you're propagating that mission. Sure. So in in 2010, I founded the Capital Institute. It's a very small uh, nonprofit whose purpose is to uh, explore um, this question of how to rethink reimagine economics and finance um, in alignment with how life works. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really become singularly focused on this, this idea of regenerative economics. Um, I've written sort of my quote seminal paper on this in 2015 and then a follow on. These are both really booklets that are on the web, on the, on the website. Um, in 2018 on regenerative finance. And, and um, we've done storytelling. We've created a, a network of uh, bioregional, bioregionally placed 
um, uh, regenerative development initiatives connected in a global network. And most recently, we've launched our first course, the Introduction to Regenerative Economics, which is really a portal into this way of thinking. Um, we just completed the first eight-week course uh, a couple of weeks ago and, and are planning on launching the second one soon. Um, but the, the, you know, think of it as a, as a, as a, as a, a place to explore this question more than anything. And, and the reason it was necessary is that, uh, I, I searched around, you know, the academic institutions wrestling with, uh, economic questions. And, um, you know, candidly, this thinking is not allowed in the academy. It's so radically different from the neoclassical foundation that, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you're not allowed in the church. If you question God, you're not allowed in the academy, if you question neoclassical economics. Um, and so it had to happen outside of, of the academy and I'm not an academic to begin with. Um, so we're much more kind of, um, uh, balancing learning through transdisciplinary thinking. So I've, I've studied ecology and biology and system science um, and philosophy and indigenous wisdom uh, much more than I've gone into studying economics. And, mm -hmm. and then I've learned through our storytelling. The, the cool thing is that the regenerative economy is emergent all around us. We just don't have the lens to see it as that. As that. But, you know, a farmer's market is the regenerative economy. Um, uh, it, it's, it's not a coincidence to me that we're, we've seen in the last 20 years farmers markets and farm to table um, and regenerative agriculture springing up everywhere. That's in response to the pressure. And, and people confuse, you know, we, we organize the economy into verticals and, and agriculture is just one industry. But in fact, and, and, it's, and to most people, it's not all that interesting because it's not that profitable and it's not that big and tech is more cool and people are getting rich in tech. Well, agriculture and, and including forestry, as you mentioned, broadly defined agriculture, you know, the, the interaction of humans and the earth uh, and fisheries, the whole, literally the entire earth, that is the foundation of, of any economy. And we, we ought to all understand how that works before we begin to think about messing with it, with our energy industry or in our technology industry and our healthcare industry, because none of those industries work if there isn't a solid foundation of the way humans interact with, with landscapes. Yeah. And it's being absolutely ravaged and it has been for the last 50 years, solidly, if not before that as well. I just have looked at the data, I think since like 1970, just on like Wikipedia when I was exploring the yeah, idea it's depressing. Mass, mass extinction. But what's really uplifting about it is that it doesn't take much to bring it all back very quickly. Not all back, yeah. but life, it, 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 it's the only great example I have of a positive feedback loop. Usually the positive feedback loop is like, oh, there's more methane coming out of the north, which is like heating up the yeah. planet even more. But in, in yeah. this example, when you plant a tree, it can plant two more trees over years right. and years. Um, right. would, you, would, you, would you mind explaining some of the tenets of regenerative economics that you have? Was, it, were those, was that in your booklet? Or I, I had watched your, your talk in 2013, which seemed like yeah, they're on the website, but I, I you know, I, I um, the first thing to say about it, though, is that there are no, you know, there is a law of gravity. There are energy laws in physics. There are no laws, equivalent laws in, in, uh, sorry about my phone, uh, in, no worries. in living systems. Um, I think of everything as a framework anyways. Yeah, it's a framework. You know, you, and it's one man's him best him. attempt to describe something that's enormously complex and reduce it to a finite number of, of, of pieces that we can get our head around. So it's, it's, it's inaccurate, but it's way more accurate than, um, uh, than we're, than, than having no framework. So I've, totally. I've reduced it to essentially eight principles. Um, and, you know, I always hesitate to just tick them off because each of them requires, an hour conversation to, to grasp, but I'll just use, uh, I'll just mention, you know, a couple of them, like the, the principle. And, and when I use the word principle, I mean it in a literal sense, not as like a value. It's not a value that I choose to have or not. It's like a descriptive first principle of how this thing works. 
So mm-hmm. one first principle of how life works is what I call right relationship. Um, you know, the indigenous uh, communities typically use the word reciprocity. The, the idea that um, things work in symbiotic win-win relationships with each other. And, you know, we've r- radically misunderstood what Darwin was teaching. Darwin didn't believe in survival of the fittest. And when he used that term, he meant survival of the one that fits best into the system. So a giraffe fits into the system because the giraffe eats the leaves off the top of the trees and doesn't compete with the zebra who eats the grass. Um, And yet we in the free market ideology have jumped on this idea that, you know, social Darwinism tells us that it's a fierce competitive world and dog eat dog and the, the, the strongest will survive. Well, no, that's not what biology tells us. So right relationship is this, you know, symbiotic relationship that applies to all of the organs in our body. It applies to the herbivores and the grass on the grasslands, as I just described. And oh, by the way, it applies to the relationship between planet Earth and the sun, which is in just right relationship, or we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, But it also relates to the idea that holism, here's, here's sort of another fundamental idea that is missing from neoclassical economics. Um, You know, the scientific revolution was all about the reductionist method, um, taking things that are complicated and breaking them down into their parts and analyzing them. And lots of great progress has resulted from that, like the man on the moon, the cell phone, all of these advances uh, were made possible through reductionist thinking. But reductionist thinking is not the way the world actually works. It's a methodology. And holistic thinking is a, is a more accurate understanding of how the world works. And holistic thinking implies that, you know, your heart and your cardiovascular system are embedded in your body and, and they need to serve the health of your body. The body is the bigger whole. Uh, the cardiovascular system is a subsystem. Translate that to economics, the financial system is a subsystem. And yet we behave as if it's, guiding the economy. So it's in, exactly inverted. It's not in right relationship. And yet we have this pursuit of efficiency ideology, which is, by the way, in conflict with another one of the principles, the principle called balance. I use the language seeks balance. Um, it turns out if you study living systems, they balance resiliency and efficiency. So you look at the supply chain crisis we're in right now. Well, we've just spent 25 to 50 years in the pursuit of efficiency in our supply chains. And and that's left them very brittle or very not resilient. And so it turns out just what a living systems framework would tell you, it turns out we have a crisis of our global supply chains because we need more resiliency in them and less efficiency. Well, guess what? That's exactly what a living systems framework tells you. And the principle is in balance. And I could I could show you diagrams that show from from real data that that's the way living systems work. Um, and, and, you know, again, we can relate to this in our body. We, we know we need to be both resilient and efficient. If we just shop for efficiency, you know, we'd be taking steroids and pumping ourselves with carbohydrates to, to run the next race and we'd be undermining our health for the long term. Uh, so it's, it's the same thing. But we need to apply that to our economics. People have a hard time with the resiliency with the resiliency stuff. They want the instant gratification yeah. today, you know. And resiliency, it's gonna cost money. And 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 yet that shows up as inflation. Oh no, we have inflation. Well, no. We actually are spending money on resiliency that's essential for our long-term health. So the inflation, let, let's make a simple example. Let's say it's gonna cost more to build uh, I don't know, whatever you want, cars in the United States, rather than to be dependent on a supply chain that is politically uh, at risk. Or, or, or a better example, let's say that there is some um, uh, efficiency lost. You know, this actually isn't true, but most people think it's true. But let's say there's some efficiency lost in not using chemical fertilizers that come from the Ukraine to, to grow our crops. But we can grow our crops without that fertilizer using regenerative agriculture. Maybe it's a little less efficient in the short term, but without being dependent on uh, fertilizer coming from the Soviet Union or, or Ukraine, we're not exposed to the supply shocks we have right now. 
but but we have to adjust the system to account for those costs that we previously eliminated because of our pursuit of efficiency. And unfortunately, that's showing up as inflation. And I'm not minimizing the, the very practical damage that this inflation is causing on you know the vast majority of people. But we misunderstand it as a problem to solve, whereas in reality, it's, it's rebalancing uh, ourselves to become more resilient for what the long term actually requires. And, and just to you know, continue the story, and therefore our central banking system, which is also born out of a Newtonian understanding, um, mm-hmm. is going to raise interest rates because that's the only tool they have. But, but raising interest rates is like a blunt force instrument that's going to cause the economy to, quote, slow down slash become less hot slash create unemployment. So there's more flex, you know, so, so that the wage pressure eases. So we're going we're gonna to damage, you know, God knows how many people's livelihoods because we've got a shock to the system that's caused by our bad economics in the first place. It's a complex topic to say, yeah. to say the least. Um, I'm very curious. It's, it sounds like you kind of got started with getting these principles in, into writing maybe like eight to 10 years ago. So I'm really wondering what you've learned from being involved with this kind of way of thinking over the last 10 years. Mm. What's new, new thoughts? Um, that's an interesting question. I would say, um, I would say by far the main thing I've learned is, and, and again, I didn't invent, just to be clear, it's not like I invented these principles. These are just my synthesis of my learning. So there, there's nothing new in them other than I wrote them as a synthesis. But you're uh, who I want to talk to about it. Was it? <laughs> I said, but you're the one I want to talk to about them. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. No, but it's, it's important not to, you know, suggest that this is not at all analogous to discovering a new thing. This is simply seeing something that everyone else sees in a new way. Um, and, and I would say a couple of things. One, everything I look at now, I look at through these, this lens. And I, I have an expression. I, I say that, um, you know, every, every snowflake is unique, but every snowflake looks like a snowflake. And so when I look at an economic model, whether it's in a, at a you know, at, in a local economy or a national economy or a business or a government policy, I can look at it through this. Le- I see it through the lens of, you know, which of the principles are showing up, which of them are in conflict. And that tells me, because this is my worldview, what is correct and what needs to change. Um, and, and I literally can't see things without seeing it through that lens. That's probably the the most powerful thing. And I, I'm probably more, you know, compared to quote normal people, I'm more practiced at that now. And so it, it's obvious to me where it isn't obvious to people that aren't, aren't experienced. It's like anything. It's like muscle to, to, to use. Um, the second thing I would say is that um, it seems to be, you know, passing the road test. Uh, the more people that kick it and, 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 and work with it, the more it seems to resonate. And so I, I feel confident that it's directionally correct. Um, I, I like to use the metaphor. It's like a compass. It's not, it's not a perfect compass, but it's a compass that's directionally correct. Um, and, and then the third thing I would say in, in answer is that um, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. The context that existed when I did the work 10 years ago um, or eight years ago is very different than the context today. So, Suddenly, you know, I could have said the exact same sentence eight years ago. In fact, it, it is an interesting little anecdote. I, I first drafted the paper. I first released a draft of the paper in 2012, convened a group of sustainability friends, experts from sustainable business and sustainable finance. There's probably 40 of us spent two days together. And I essentially presented it and said, tell me what you think. You know, it was like a peer review process in person. And I, I was really depressed. Everyone was arguing. Everyone was resisting. This is no good. That's not this. This isn't the way, you know, it was, it was a, a total failure. And, um, and these were my friends. This was like a friendly audience, not, uh, you know, not, not um, you know, they, they meant it. They, they were well-meaning. They weren't, they weren't 
disrespectful or mean, but they didn't get it. They didn't like it. They said, what are you doing? And, um, and now, um, it, 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 when I have a chance to, to roll it out, like we just did in, in the course, the feedback I get from business people and young people is, um, is not, this makes sense, but I'll never be able to see the world the same way again, nor my place in the world the same way again. Literally, that's right. what people say. And so, and that's not because I've figured out how to say it better. That's because the the zeitgeist, the the, the culture, the, you know, the, the 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 environment that we're wrestling with, has become you know very different. Certainly post the pandemic. John, what does it mean to be successful to you? Wow, I just had this conversation with my friend Rob Johnson the other day. Um, well, now you're getting into the, you know you you want me to get on the couch now or you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right that's what this is the kind of stuff I like to talk about <laughs> yeah so you know I I w- w- the first thing I'd have to say is what I think about my purpose in life today versus what I thought of as success in old John are radically different. And, and, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, I've been through my version of a midlife crisis, put it that way. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I'll, I'll share an anecdote. The, 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 um, the, this is a true story. I was sitting in an airplane when I was 35 and I had just been promoted to head of the global commodities division of JP Morgan. We were going to integrate derivatives with commodities and it said, I don't know if you're too, too young to remember, but Enron was taking over the world and natural gas and, you know, using derivatives and, and, and yet Morgan was the, the king of derivatives. And so, and we had a commodities business. So anyway, it's this huge Sexy opportunity. Stuff. What? Sexy stuff. Sexy stuff. Yeah. And, I, and here I'm this young Turk that was going to run this global business. And, you know, that was success. And I was on top of the world and I'm sitting in first class airline, Singapore Air is on my way to Singapore or Hong Kong or somewhere. Uh, when I first got the job to meet the troops out there and uh, I, I had, we had just had our second child. So I had two daughters at home, one about two and one about zero. <laughs> and, um, and the day I happened to be flying was a Sunday and it happened to be Father's Day. And I'm miserable because I want to be home. And, um, but I'm successful because I'm now the global head of blah, blah, blah. And so I'm, I'm sitting in this dissonance and, um, and I have the New York times on my lap and, and, um, when you have two young children, you don't get to read the New York times on Sunday morning. You, you're dealing with, with babies and stuff. And so I had lots of time. I had a 12 hour flight. So I have the New York times and I'm champ glass of champagne. Everything's good. And I look down and there's an article on the left side. Uh, which is all about a, a man named Walter Annenberg. And uh, he, you know, he had just decided to give away basically his, his entire fortune to a group of academic institutions. So he's written up in the New York Times as the hero of our society, right? That's success. He, he was a media mogul, made his fortune, and now he's giving it away as a proper philanthropist does. And you know, that was, you know, in, in a sense, metaphorically, the newspaper had the story of success in our culture right there, staring me in the face. And then on the right hand column, there was an article about how mismanaged, corrupt, screwed up the government low income housing system was front page news. And I forget, you know, corruption, all this stuff. And it hit me like a ton of bricks that um, there's all these problems in the world um, that need energy and, and, and uh, focus to fix. And yet our culture tells us to pursue success so that we can become a philanthropist to deal with the problems. And I literally said to myself on that plane ride, I'm not going to be this guy, meaning Walter Annenberg. And so in many ways, even though that was five years before I actually walked away from Wall Street, I really quit my career that day um, because I knew I wasn't going to pursue, quote, success uh, in the way the culture defined it. I just didn't know what I was going to do, but that, that plane ride probably seeded this angst that developed into a voice that told me to leave when the merger happened. 
So I don't know if that answered your question, but. Yeah. So success, you, you, you got to figure it out. Um, well, first of all, I, I don't think there is a definition of success. Um, I think, I think we all have a purpose and, um, increasingly, I think that, you know, we, we all go through some, you know, we, as we grow up, you know, we, we have to go out and establish our, you know, our ego needs to stick a stake in the ground and, and, and get some accomplishment and self-confidence and, and that takes hard work and drive and that's all good and healthy. You know, a, 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 a little bird needs to learn how to fly um, or it's going to be a dead bird, not a, not a, not a, not an adult bird. But at some point um, the problem with our culture and, and our, our definition of success is we don't know when we're ready to shift gears into the next phase. And, um, and in many ways you could describe the problem of our economy as, you know, we're stuck in adolescent gear and, and haven't, matured mm-hmm. into adult gear. Um, like and adult that. gear is, you know, I, I have no desire to go compete with some guy from Goldman Sachs to figure out who's got the most money or who made the biggest bonus. I, I'm totally um, driven and passionate about this question that I'm holding. And and there is no success. There's One of my teachers, Wes Jackson, said, if you're working on a problem that you can solve in your lifetime, you're not thinking big enough. So, like you know, for too. me, success now is, is trying to um, understand who I am and my unique talent that I bring and, and manifest that. Um, and, it, and it's, you know, I don't want this to sound trite, but it, is, it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with what I'm in service of. No, I think that's fantastic. Do you believe that we'll ever reach a fully regenerative economy? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 um, see the thing about the regenerative process is that no matter what happens, um, you know, it is what is existing will not continue. It's Mm -hmm. it's physically impossible. And, and the way living systems, uh, cycle is they go through different phases and I'm, I'm, I'm doing this on purpose because there's something called the adaptive cycle, which defines or describes how living systems cycle. And so they, they kind of, they grow and, and expand and then they mature and then they, they release energy and reform themselves. And in, in spiritual language, we call that reincarnation. Uh, but death is part of life and um, uh, and companies go through that same cycle, and the whole economy is, has always been going through that cycle. So, you know, there, there's energy being released right now. There are people walking out of, you know, the grand resignation or whatever we call it. That's energy being released out of the old system. People are saying, I don't want to do this anymore. I, you know, my son has said, I'm not going to sit in a cubicle and stare at a computer. I'm not going to do it. And so there's there's already energy being released out of this old system. And, and reformulating into some new form that's yet to be defined. And so to me, that is the regenerative economy. Um, and that doesn't mean every company is going to be regenerative, but the system as a whole is going through this change process. And, and I think you and I happen to live in at a moment where that change process is, is, is intense. It's a change yeah. in era. It's not just more change. And um, so, yeah, in, in that sense, we have no choice. Everything has to be regenerative. The question is how much damage are we going to do in the release phase to, you know, think of it as a, as a forest fire. Um, let's say it's a a hundred acre, a million acre forest. Uh, is there going to be a few brush fires that then require regeneration or is the whole damn thing going to burn down and then it's going to regenerate? The answer is somewhere in between in our current economy and where in between is largely a function of what we do in, you know, with our, with all of our collective work. So if you're working on renewable energy, it matters. If you're working on 
automobiles, it matters. If you're working on regenerative agriculture, it matters. If you're working on the purpose of a corporation, it matters. And all that added together is going to lead to something that is unknowable, literally unknowable. But by definition, it will be regenerative because uh, what's happening today will have to stop, will have to be released. Have you read any of Ray Dalio's work? A little bit. Yeah, I think I don't know. I think you might really like it. It's been very, it's been very interesting talking to you today to see the the way your mind works and how you've brought brought in this interesting connection. I just want you to know you you've positively influenced me, not just today, but through your work. And I look forward to kind of looking into more of the work that Capital Institute is doing. So, John, thank you, thank you for the time today. It's it's been a real pleasure. Do you have any final pieces of advice for young folks who are passionate about building a better world? Hmm. Um, come take our course. We're working on getting, we're working on getting, um, um, uh, more financial support, but it, it's the best thousand dollars people will spend and, and we'll have some scholarships. Where can people find the course? Capitalinstitute.org. Okay. You'll, you'll meet a community that you will not regret being part of. Yes. I would like to take the course. Let's talk about potential scholarship opportunities. There you go. <laughs> All right, John. It's it's been a real pleasure. You you've earned a scholarship from all your good work, Ethan. So I appreciate it. I'll personally subsidize it. I like it. I like it. All right, everybody. We'll see you on the next one. Take it easy. Good to be with you, Ethan. So if you or anyone else you know is looking to buy or sell a home anywhere in the USA and would like to create thousands of dollars in donations without any cost out of pocket, please visit ccrealty.org today.